uh, the last guy gave a shout out to his mom, so I have to give a shout out to my mom or else I don't really want to go home today. Mom? Love you too, mom. Okay. <laughs> so my mom. <laughs> So, uh, and, and my husband and my children and, and friends and family, thank you for coming and thank you for this big audience. This is very exciting. Um, first, a little audience participation. How much is gas today in Michigan? <laughs> Too much. Yeah. Okay. Stupid government. Let's shut them down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How much is gas in Michigan today? That's the best price in Michigan right now. So, the, so on, on michigan-low-cost-gas.com, this is the cheapest you can get gas in Michigan as of about 4.30 this morning. Um, that gas price says, run right out and buy a hybrid vehicle. At about 2.50 or so a gallon, it makes economic sense to get a hybrid vehicle. Uh, it doesn't quite yet make sense to buy an electric vehicle. There are subsidies now, but that will change. Batteries are actually an enabler for all kinds of good things. Uh, batteries are an enabler for reducing carbon emissions, for eliminating the two infrastructures we have right now in North America, a fuel infrastructure and an electron infrastructure, a grid infrastructure. Maintaining both of those infrastructures is actually very expensive. And the chances are very good that the emerging economies, where seven or eight billion people will join the middle class in the next 10 or 20 years, uh, the chances are very good that they'll only select one infrastructure. Batteries are an enabler for that, batteries in vehicles uh, particularly. When you make a battery cell, as, as I have done, as my colleagues have done, a few elements are important. And everybody, raise your hand if you're really excited to see the periodic table today. <laughs> very good. I like, I like that ability to lie socially. It's a feature in being a Midwesterner. <laughs> Um, a few elements are important, and there's a reason on the periodic table that everybody tries to move to the north uh, when you figure out what kind of a power supply to build. And that is because the atomic numbers are lower and the materials are less dense, they weigh less. So when you're paying to carry around your own power supply, it makes a lot of sense to look for lightweight elements to store ions and electrons and exchange them in a reaction, and I promise that's the last I'll say about that. But these elements here, wind up being very important. And that's why everybody's been chasing lithium battery technology. And you've hear, been hearing a lot about lithium batteries in the news, and that's the reason. It's material that's very low mass and allows you to store a lot of energy. Um, anybody remember the guy on the left? Uh, I vote for Darshan to get a new cell phone, but <laughs> the guy on the left is Michael Douglas back when he was the, you know, really cute and everything, and he had the mullet and going. And that's a really large cell phone, and the re what, part of the reason that cell phone is really, really big is because the battery cells in that cell phone are really, really big. Of course, antennas got better, power electronics got better, circuits got better, low power circuits got better, but batteries got better. And those better batteries enabled devices like the next generation iPhone shown on the right. How many of you have a, a cell phone right now? Okay. Raise your hand, keep your hand up if you have a Bluetooth headset as well, or an iPod, or some other kind of MP3 player. You guys are bristling with electronics, okay? And part of the reason is that battery technology has gotten better. It enables smaller and smaller, more powerful devices that actually change the way we live. They got cheaper, too. So how we track battery progress uh, usually is, is with a plot like the one shown on the left. That's a plot of specific energy density, which is energy divided by mass. Remember I told you mass is really important when you carry around your own power supply, against time. And specific energy density has increased very dramatically uh, over the last decade and a half. Meanwhile, the battery costs, interestingly, have dropped. Who in here is an economics major? You are unsurprised. The battery costs have dropped as battery sales have risen and performance has gotten better, okay? And the reasons are multifarious, but simply uh, because we got better at making them. Because smart people, <laughs> besides me, swarmed into the space and started working on the technology and improved it, okay? And that allowed the cost to come down. And of course, as the cost came down and batteries got better, more people bought them and the sales went up. 
Something strange happened in about 2004 that happens with a lot of generations of any given technology. Anybody remember nickel metal hydride batteries? Okay. Anybody have a Prius? You are the proud owner of some nickel metal hydride batteries probably. Those are in the Prius and they were the last generation of cell phones and consumer electronics had nickel metal hydride batteries. And when I first started working in batteries uh, about 16 years ago, uh, every say, ah, it's astry. Nobody's ever going to buy lithium batteries. They're dangerous. They blow up. And, you know, metal hydride batteries are all good. And, by the way, lithium batteries are always going to cost more than metal hydride batteries. No. What happened in 2004 was that lithium batteries actually got cheaper than nickel metal hydride batteries. And that's also normal because a lot of people, a lot of innovators rushed into the space and beat the costs out of these systems. Um, here's where we're at with automobiles, though. And automobiles are the big problem, right? So consumer electronics are one gigantic market for, for battery cell technology. But auto markets, as I'll show you in a minute, will dwarf those, those markets. And if we look at the cost curve, the cost per kilowatt hour against volume for 1,000 vehicles, divided by 1,000 vehicles, you see that metal hydride costs, nickel metal hydride costs, the blue lines, kind of leveled out. We don't really expect a lot of cost to come out of these systems. Enough people are making these at scale and have researched this problem and have done technology development on this problem that we really don't think that those battery cells are going to get a lot cheaper. We have every reason to think that lithium ion batteries are going to get a lot cheaper because we're not making too many of them right now. So at about 300,000 vehicles or so, uh, the lithium ion cost will cross over. Okay. There are 1,500 people in this room. I thought I'd do something fun. Um, kids, cover your ears. Uh, I wonder if I can get everybody to say, oh, shit, all at once. One, two, three. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. When, when one of these gets in the news, you kind of, you kind of, you know, people ask you what you do. You sit next to somebody at a ball game. What do you do? I work on batteries. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't, pictures like this don't exactly make you want to run right out and put lithium batteries in your car, right? Okay. Um, but there are ways to manage the risk. And one of the ways, of course, is to make better battery cells. So the Chevy Volt doesn't use batteries like the laptop battery I just showed you. They use a much higher quality of battery. It's made with much greater precision. And it uses another technique which is to change the usage of the battery cell technology to make it more safe. So even though the Chevy Volt carries around 220 cells, weighing about 220 pounds in the vehicle, uh, uses only about half, 8.8 .8 kilowatt hours, of the 16 kilowatt hours on board the vehicle. Instead of charging all the way up and discharging all the way down, which can stress the battery, it hovers in the middle. And it would sort of be like driving around in your IC engine driven car with the gas at half, er, the gas at full and only driving until you had a half a tank left. Okay, half tank, full tank, half tank, full tank. That means, of course, that you're always carrying around a half a tank of gas. And if you're in your car and you're carrying around a big heavy object, what happens to your range? Leaders and best. <laughs> what happens to your range? Goes up or down? Down, very good, it was 50-50. So it goes down. <laughs> and, uh, and that's not good, right? What you want to do is you want to be able to use the whole range of the propulsion system. That requires use of some science. So one of the things that my teams at the university have worked on for many years is understanding what's happening inside of battery cells in order to manage the thermal swings, the mechanical swings, the strains, uh, the electron density and so forth, so we can design materials that don't get so hot and don't have such concentrations of charges and so forth. And some of my students are here, Min and Sangman, nice to see you. Uh, particle scale, understanding the physics, all the way down to the atomic scale, which is understanding how the materials are put together. And the way the batteries are made right now creates these really porous structures that have a high surface area to volume ratio. That's a a longer way of saying it has a lot of reactive surface. So if you can build a material that way, in some ways it's very efficient. But the downside is that you get a concentration of heat, electrons, and stress. So three years ago, my 
colleagues, Dr. Fabio Albano and Dr. Chai Wei Wang and I, decided to throw away the script and try something different. Instead of making batteries the way they're shown on the left, which is wet slurry particulate batteries, we decided to make them all very evenly and precisely as shown on the right, sort of like we make chips. Um, not just silicon chips, um, but bags for chips, like potato chip bags and beer can labels and things like that. We tried to make battery cells using production equipment that could be very rapidly scaled, but also created these very precise layers. And these uh, are called solid state batteries because they don't have any liquid electrolyte in them. So it's a different way of thinking about the problem. And SACT3 is now a team of people from eight different countries, from four different uh, disciplines, um, eight major research universities, and I'm very proud to be a part of that team. But that's what we're working on now. Solid state batteries are the next batteries we'll all be using. There's very little scientific doubt about that. The energy density of these batteries is much, much higher. And when you look at what happened from lead acid to NiCad to metal hydride to today's lithium batteries to solid state, it's clear where everybody's going to be running. The trick is to figure out how to do it safely and cheaply. And so that's what my technology teams are working on right now. It could change everything. Consumer electronics uh, comprising about a billion cell phones or so, about 70 million laptop computers, uh, consume about 2.4 terawatt hours of energy per year, which feels like a pretty big number um, until you think about what cars are going to use. The US vehicle fleet, about 220 million vehicles or so, would require 1,300 terawatt hours to convert if all of those cars were turned from IC engine driven vehicles into electric vehicles. That's a lot of batteries. Okay, so a lot of people are going to be working in batteries and working on battery problems because it is a cheap, uh, safe way uh, in the main to store energy. The world vehicle fleet dwarfs the American vehicle fleet. And if I can leave you with one thought today, I hope it's that you're thinking about the markets that we have to serve. North America is the aspirational market. It's a trial ground for a lot of new technology. But unless we can address the emerging economies in the 8, 9, 10 billion people that are going to come online in the middle class, we will fail as a nation economically. We have to address those markets. And 790 million vehicles comprising 4,700 terawatt hours per year dwarfs both the American vehicle fleet and the American consumer electronics industry. In doing so, Big companies are going to act like small innovators. GM is going to make investments in little SACD 3s of the world. Small innovators will think like big companies. We think about buying equipment that can scale right away. And universities and industry will adopt new models of collaboration and share roles. My team is very proud of our University of Michigan DNA. And we had the support of the university in spinning out the company. And uh, we feel very privileged to be executing our technology here. We have a lot of partners. We also have models. In Silicon Valley, this happened some years ago in the life sciences area. A uh, few major research universities spawned the biotech industry. And so this has happened before. And I think one of the things we'll see in this region is innovators at University of Michigan and Michigan State University and Wayne State University will be <laughs> spinning out technologies that change the way we, we build and, and use vehicles. If I could leave you with one thought, it's lace up. It's going to be very interesting in the automotive world. It's going to be very interesting in the technology business. Uh, and I hope to have many of you participate, not only as engineers, but also as policymakers, assuming we have a government tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> and that you'll be part of this change, at a minimum, by a hybrid or electric vehicle. Thank you very much.